The article I reviewed in this month's issue of Science of Rowing is a study on rowing coaches' self-awareness of feedback, type, timing, and nature. The coaches used a lot of concurrent and prescriptive verbal feedback with the majority aimed at incorrect elements of technique and a very high amount of off-task feedback rather than on-task feedback. Those are problems, but even worse, the coaches were very inaccurate when the researchers surveyed them about this, and they thought that they used more terminal feedback, more affective and evaluative feedback, more correct elements uh, feedback, and also on task than they actually did. So that's all in the December issue of Science of Rowing with takeaways for how coaches can improve self-awareness of technical verbal feedback. Dr. Sarah Erdner joins us in the bonus content of this issue to discuss another element of self-awareness more on the psychosocial and emotional side of things. So Sarah, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And please tell our viewers about yourself and your work in coach education. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me, Will. Um, I am an assistant professor of coaching at Adams State University that is in Alamosa, Colorado. Some people might not know exactly where that's at, and that's okay. We're a very small town, very rural. Um, I'm a, the coordinator of our Masters of Coaching program as well, which is fully online. So if there's anybody listening to this, thinking about getting further education in their master's degrees, um, check out our online Masters of Coaching program at Adams State. Um, I teach it um, in both the applied sports psych and coaching degrees there. Um, and then I also just am very passionate about passionate about coaching education in the sense of, of course, I wrote a book called Dear Coach, What I Wish I Could Have Told You, Letters uh, from Your Athletes. And it's all about how can we start the conversation between athletes and coaches, uh, because there's a lot of things that athletes have left unsaid or haven't felt safe saying to their coaches. And so my book itself, uh, inspired by my dissertation, all the research I've done in the coaching education realm, and it's kind of my my love child, if you will, giving back to the coaching education community, instead of having this research just sit in research journals, how could I have helped bridge the gap between research and boots on the ground people such as the coaches that listen, that is listening today. And um, so I, and I work a lot with the USCC, United States Center for Coaching Excellence, um, talk a lot with UK, their sport federation, just in how can we move sport forward. So I have my hand in a lot of different um, pots on ultimately my mission my impact I want to make is how can we creatively rethink sport rethink systems so that they're not just safer for athletes but also safer for all sport stakeholders including coaches and sport administrators yeah and dear coach is as far as I'm aware a first in coach education as far as being a novel length non-textbook uh kind of more commercially available or accessible resource is that accurate Yes, uh, when I I realized there was a need for this book when I was going to the bookshelves of Barnes and Nobles and Books a Million and going on Amazon and not really seeing what we were seeing is books written by coaches to coaches on how to be better coaches, which is just perpetuating a larger problem that these athletes in my dissertation research uh, in the further letters that I received from athletes, and so there were no voices from the athletes on those shelves. Uh, and so this book helps fill that gap of starting that conversation of privileging the athlete voice. They're all confidential letters, of course, um, where I take out gendered language sports because I really wanted to get to the message and the themes of these letters so that we could say, hey, let's imagine sport. Let's set aside what we've known about sport all these years and let's all imagine together. And then if we all came to a table. So in the, in the end of the book, I provide my like, if I was at the table, these were the steps that I would suggest that we move forward on different policies that we should create, different initiatives that we should do. But I want to, uh, I, I bring the audience and the reader in those that are listening to this podcast on what would you, after reading these letters or even considering your own letter, um, what would you bring to that table? Let's start. I, I, I'm an expert, yes, in this field, but I don't think that my, uh, everything that I have to give is the end all be all either. I love to co-create. Yeah, and it's not prescriptive. There's no, like Dr. Erdner says, do this. It's all, here's just the material. Here's the lived experience of the athletes um, and, and the coaches and yourself. Um, is it fair to say that, that a big goal of that is kind of increasing coaches' self-awareness by, by way of telling the athletes' experience in a way that we might not be familiar with? For sure. I uh, This book went through like 20 different iterations through, I mean, it took me three years to, to write. And um, and the iterations were, it started out very prescriptive. And to be quite honest with you, and, and I'm, I'm sharing about 
my own self-awareness. So if we put myself in, in a coaches, you know, I am a professor. And so I kind of coach students in a way, if you want to look at it like that. Um, I was teaching a methods of coaching class and I stood up in front of the class and I was talking to them about self-awareness. We, we were teaching out of a particular textbook and um, about how they need to self-awareness is being aware enough to know when to step back and hear the athlete's voice and co-create the sporting environment to make it less prescriptive. And as I was talking to them, I stopped dead in my tracks. They were like, Dr. Erner, is everything cool? Are you okay? And I was like, um, I'm going to go ahead and out myself here. Um, I'm sitting here teaching you all to do this, to be more self-aware and self-awareness helps you step back and to co-create and all this stuff. But yet I'm writing my book in such a way that isn't that. And I'm actually perpetuating the same problem that I'm preaching against. So then I called my editor immediately after class and was like, Amanda, I hate to say this, but I have to completely reformat this book. And it actually got to where the book is today, which I think is um, self-awareness is, is reflective. It's very reflective in nature. It's very vulnerable in nature. And so the way my book is set up is I want to bring the coach in for me, not to say, Hey, here's this letter. This is what you should get from it. But here's this letter. What resonated with you and how can you implement this? Cause I, I for me, my own self-awareness was how can I honor the reader's voice and, and honor the reader's their own lived experiences is how it's interacting with the with the letters um, themselves and so I think self-awareness is um, it's it's a slow down process it's a let me put a mirror up to myself and maybe have to swallow the hard truths of what I have done such as what I had to do in front of my methods of coaching class and basically just say wow i hey, I'm going to use myself as an example here in not a great way. And it was such a great learning point for them, for me to not only model like, wow, let me apologize really quickly. And then also these are the steps I'm going to do moving forward to correct my quote unquote wrongs, if you will. Yeah. Um, and so I think just self-awareness in general is something that can really help create better coach-athlete relationships uh, with better coach-athlete relationships at the foundation. The athletes are going to absorb the x's and o's better etc cetera, etc cetera. so I mean, we're getting a little into my into my other first question here of like sell me on the benefits of self-awareness kind of if somebody is skeptical of this you know i'm a busy coach i have a lot to think about i've got fundraising and recruiting and game planning and all this other stuff and now i've got to think about psycho or emotional self-awareness as well what's what's your what's your pitch there why is that why is that beneficial I think the very elevator pitch is you can spend as much energy as you want on the X's and the O's and, and all of that. But if you do not have a quality foundation, if you think about a home, like, you know, I was raised in the church. So the, the home, like if you build a house on sand, it's going to, the storm's going to come in and it's going to. Um, and so if you build your house on sand, which is having a faulty relation, the, not having that psychosocial, emotional aspects that build a quality coach athlete relationship there when the storm comes and and the adversity comes all those x's and o's that you've been preaching about boom they don't stick as well they're gone um you lose trust when you build everything upon a quality foundation that coach athlete relationship including the psychosocial emotional aspects then that athlete is going to um give even more to you they're going to listen even more to you they're going to trust you even more so it really helps with it takes the work that you're putting in on the exercise even farther for the coach and which is why it's important and part of what i appreciated too from dear coach was the emphasis on kind of coach longevity in the sport that a lot of us get burned out and frustrated and we're dealing with the same problems over and over again and i think that the the common thing to do is to think that i just need to strategize harder or game plan harder but what i got from your book is sort of this this self-reflective ability is in many ways the missing ingredient in solving that as well yeah and i want to talk a little bit about um self-awareness too and in, in multiple there, there's different levels here we often think about self-reflect or self-awareness is like, oh, just reflect on what you're doing and do better. But self self-awareness is also understanding yourself as a cultural being, and bringing in diversity, equity, and inclusion measures into that. And what I mean is, we oftentimes have teams that say, oh, they'll bring athletes in and they're like, this is the culture, so you have to basically become the culture. 
Well, guess what? The culture is the makeup of the entire team. It's not about deducing the athlete's bodies into the culture that you as a cultural being who maybe is a white male has all the privileged check marks, right? And you're asking these other bodies, even if they do match up to your same demographic questionnaire checklist, to deduce themselves to your biases and assumptions of what the culture should be, but rather the culture needs to ebb and flow and change every single season and or with the addition or subtraction of an athlete, because the culture is made up of those unique identities of everybody in the team. And an example of what this could look like, I'm I'm currently working with a um, cross country and track and field team right now, and they have a very diverse group. I mean, they speak there's maybe five to seven different languages they speak amongst that group. And one of the things we talked about based on that culture to give some practical strategy here is how can we come up with a team word, right? Like when you get in the huddle and you say one, two, three, and you say your team word, what if we actually taught the entire team how to not just say that team word in English, but they said that team word in every single respective language that's represented on that team. And the deeper message being had there is we we don't want to deduce non-verb, like um, unconsciously, these other uh, native speakers' languages into the English speaking, because that's what's easy to do. We want to honor you as your eclectic self. And that has to start with coaches and sport administrators first understanding themselves as cultural beings. And there's many exercises that I do with coaches to help them understand that, because once we can be self-aware of ourselves as the cultural being, we can then better relate to see others through the lens as cultural beings, and then also take ownership of maybe how we've wronged others by subconsciously imposing our biases and assumptions onto people. What are some of the biggest challenges that you face in getting people to hear this message or that coaches face and actually acting on it? Yes, I think a huge challenge, I was actually speaking to a methods of coaching class yesterday that I guess lectured in on this, that there is a discrepancy between policies that are in place, such as the hiring, retention, and firing of coaches versus the research and and what gets the best out of athletes. And what I mean by that is coaches are, you know, those of you that are listening, you're like, oh, I love all of this stuff. And at the same time, the likelihood you're often hired, retained, and fired based on your win loss record. Or so I there's a make dis- that boat faster, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And so you're like, yeah, I get that, but I'm only being evaluated based on my rap sheet, based on the stats that are showing at the end of the day. They're not hiring, retaining, and firing me based on the type of relationships I'm creating. And so there's that discrepancy there. And so for those of you that might be listening who are in a position to make that cultural change, to change the system in your neck of the woods where you're at, think about those hiring, retention, and firing processes that you have. Is it a good old boys club, if you will, on was somebody recommended to you? Oh, they're great. They show you their rap sheet. What other questions could you ask in that hiring, retention, firing process that gets at measuring the coach-athlete relationship, gets at the athlete safety, um, gets at these other aspects of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion so that these coaches know that you will be hired, retained, and fired on this. And it makes it more of a priority than just a, oh, that sounds like a good idea. So I think the higher up the way that sport is created, the the history of sport, um, you know, very quickly sport was created by men for men to produce better men. And then if we, that was centuries ago, Fast forward to 1972 when Title IX comes about and allows access to marginalized individuals into sport, such especially as women. But what they never did is while we threw confetti in the air and got all excited about it, we never actually went back to the foundational narrative of which sport was written upon. So what actually happened is we asked these, and I'll use this in in a gendered way, we asked these females, for example, to chasse their way into on a dance floor, and that dance floor is the foundation of created by men for men to produce better men. And it's actually deducing these women, these beautiful women's bodies into the round, the the square beautiful women's bodies into the round hole that is male sport. And that's where you get a lot of these stereotypes of, oh, women aren't as, you know, X or they're not as Y, or maybe you're not cut out. And and that's not just for women, that's for other marginalized groups. And so I think there's uh, uh, challenges at the uh, hiring, retention, firing level. There's socio-cultural challenges that we have. Um, and the more self-aware that we can become, not just within ourselves interpersonally, intrapersonally, 
which will then help us be more self-aware interpersonally between two people. But the more self-aware that we can then become of the, the social system that we're in, that can help to decrease those challenges. Sure. And I think drawing the connection between the article that I wrote on technical feedback awareness, you've got to know those concepts to begin with at like an academic or strictly knowledge-based level. And then you've got to know how you can actually manipulate or put those concepts into practice at your level. And then you've got to be able to, to get better at doing that. And I think in, in technical feedback, people give coaches the room to try with that with mm -hmm. other forms of interaction. That's not necessarily there. Um, and yeah, definitely take your point that like if we're being evaluated based on speeds or win loss or, or metal placings, then it's kind of hard to say, yes, there's this whole other section that we need to be focusing on unless there's kind of a, a evaluation rubric and things that are going to make that stick for, for the coach. And it sounds like you're saying that that sort of starts with like the athletic department basically saying this is what we want a priority to be. Yeah. And I do want to just mention this because some of like your audience being coaches likely, you know, they're probably like, okay, great, but I don't have a lot of say in that. So what can you do? Sure. You know, there are a lot of continuing education things out there. There are on diversity, equity, inclusion mm -hmm. that you can look at. Um, there are, um, you know, getting a master's of coaching degree mm -hmm. and an online master's of coaching degree. You know, a lot of the students that we have now are currently full-time coaching, um, they're full-time, you know, and so again, there are barriers, right, to putting that money in their socioeconomic status stuff that's there, but um, seeking out those different things that you can do, being more intentional about the psychosocial stuff, uh, maybe instead of going to an X's and, o con X's and O's conference, maybe one year you go to uh, an applied sports psych conference or, uh, ASP. A so yeah, ASP yeah. or a social justice conference yeah. of sorts, and you can go, that's in sport, um, and you can learn a little bit more that way yeah yeah i think especially now with uh online education kind of being more available both via webinars and and online conferences as well as through formal education programs i did mine online with with our mutual friend dr garrity uh, mm -hmm. at the university of denver and same thing i wasn't introduced to any of these concepts in undergrad until that and that kind of seems like the role of higher education to really introduce people to more yeah. than just the technical and the tactical side of things exactly um, so where do we go from here? How, how, how do we improve coaching and sport for the next generation of athletes? Huge question. So uh, it is, yeah. I think that there's so many, and this is where, like in my book, I say, Hey, like th these are some things that I think we sh should do moving forward. And, and then what do you think? Right. So, um, you know, I kind of invite the audience as you're speaking. And as I'm talking, I want you to get your imagination wheels churning on, you know, where would you want to go from here? You know? Uh, I think the first place is to ask, and I want to directly ask this audience, like, how do you feel safe? I think we talk so much about athlete safety and athlete mental health and athletes, uh, you know, everything is about the athlete, everything is about the moneymaker, and we're not creating a safe space for the coaches. And I think that's such a, I, I'm extremely passionate about that because everything trickles down. If we have coaches that aren't mentally healthy or coaches that don't feel safe or don't feel advocated for or, or what have you, they then are not going to be able to mimic that same behavior likely to their athletes. And so, um, again, this is a top down uh, effect. And, and so one of the things I've mentioned in the book, uh, this isn't the only thing is we talk so much about athlete mental health initiatives, which I love, I champion, I don't think they should go anywhere. And at the same time, in my time as a, as a CMPC working, a mental performance consultant, working with athletes, gosh, anywhere from 70 to 90% of a lot of their mental performance issues are because of the coach invoking them. And again, what about coach mental health initiatives? What about them? They are under extreme stress. There's crazy burnout. Um, they're rarely getting to see their families. Uh, you know, there's all the travel that goes on. I mean, it's, I've been able to be around the sport arena enough to just be like the side observer of, of the coach life. And we're not, what are, I don't see a lot going into them and their own well being. And I think we are in athlete mental health initiatives. It's a band aid approach. And, but we can really start seeing more deeper rooted pattern changes when we start with coach mental health initiatives, sport administrator mental health initiatives, actually providing them that space and encouraging them to go seek that out. Not just saying, oh, go talk to your significant other or your other coaching pals and cathartically complain. 
I think that's one one place that we can go a direction that I would love love to go obviously I know that that means more money and, and putting stuff in and um, but to me it's it's worth it if we're um, if we are truly wanting to create a safe space and not just for athletes but for everyone involved yeah I think it's also a, another message of self-awareness that as coaches we're really used to putting the athletes first and uh, there was one season where I was coaching the college men's team in the morning and I was coaching a high school team in the evening and also working in between. It was really hard for me to dedicate the time to even get a workout in mm. because that time kind of meant like, well, I could be practice planning then. And it's, it's my workout now versus 30 athletes practice mm. later today. But you can't be your healthy best self, unless you're kind of giving yourself those, those times. Um, so I think from what, from what I'm hearing from you and kind of against my own experience, like just even giving coaches that knowledge or that space to say like, yes, it is okay to put yourself emotionally, physically um, first, some of the time, at least like to take care of yourself is an important message. For sure. And, you know, I do like want to promote my book and say, hey, you know, dear coach, I think would be great uh, for people to get into. And it's a, a good place to start on self-awareness for you to reconnect with yourself through to reflect on your own coaching through the lens of what athletes need. But I also want to suggest another book for the audience is um, I just got done reading it and I actually just started reading it again because it's one of those like, gosh, I just want to read this every day. It's called The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. And the reason why, I mean, again, talking about self-awareness, The Untethered Soul, just in a nutshell, and it goes, Michael Singer does a wonderful job of breaking down some really abstract gray area things uh, about consciousness, about self-awareness, uh, so that you can really grasp it a little better. But there, there's these stupid, like, I think, therefore I am, you know, and I'm somebody who used to subscribe to that. I'd be like, oh, positive thoughts lead to positive actions and negative thoughts lead to negative actions. And then when I would accidentally have a negative thought pop up, I'd be like, oh God, something bad's about to happen. This is, this is bound to happen. Um, the untethered soul, and this is a whole nother group, uh, aspect of self-awareness and consciousness. Like we are not our thoughts and our emotions. They just, they just pop up. They just come out of nowhere because we, uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, we have a negativity bias in our brain. So we have a higher probability of thinking more negative things, but the more that we can untether ourselves from our thoughts and our emotions and realize that we are, it's not, I think, therefore I am like, it's almost like, I think, therefore I am not that. Yeah. And like, also yeah. I am. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like you have more of a conscious, you can more consciously live your life than like, oh, I just, all these things uh, uh, unintentionally pop up, but being able that book uh, takes you on a journey to reconnecting to your higher sense of consciousness and that higher sense of consciousness metaphorically almost looks like you're sitting in this chair, the way I envision it, I'm sitting in this like Royal chair in the top of the crown of my head. And I'm just watching this movie of all my thoughts and emotions, just kind of uh, flowing by and sometimes laughing at them, sometimes getting sad about them, whatever. But I, again, I detach and, and let them flow by and I don't attach judgment to them or anything. And I think self-awareness goes hand in hand with living a mindful life. The more mindful we can be, because when you are being self-aware and have a mirror held up to you, there's going to be some hard truths. And if we don't also couple mindfulness, which is that uh, noticing the thought or emotion coming up, not placing judgment on it, but then just bringing ourselves back to our higher sense of awareness and consciousness, then we're not going to beat ourselves up for these hard truths that are going to come up. We're not going to feel that shame and guilt. And so I want to throw that book suggestion out there to the audience because I think it's a wonderful one personally, but also can benefit coaches professionally on how they're speaking to athletes um, and also help them through their self-awareness journey. Yeah. And with Dear Coach, like there definitely were some letters where I kind of responded as like, oh my goodness, how could this coach, you know, like not, not have seen this or be doing this. But then there were other letters that, that I read that was like, you know, I could have been that coach in, in some of the circumstances. And it was hard to not want to like, think that we could go back and like undo all of that. And that's kind of the, the message of it is like, read it, absorb it, reflect on it, and then use that awareness to kind of try to do better. So um, for sure. Well, I want to say two, two more things. One thing is um, in the book, there, there's often 
there are 30 letters. There are thank you letters in the book. Mm -hmm. And so you can also learn so much from those thank you letters and what athletes love that coaches did. So it's not just a book of athletes bashing coaches. Um, Secondly, never underestimate the power of apologizing if you are in a position to apologize. And so maybe that means you approaching an athlete and saying, hey, this just came into my awareness and I truly was unconscious of it, but I need to apologize for you for X, Y, and Z so much power in that. And and you're demonstrating vulnerability to athletes and vulnerability begets vulnerability. And so you want your athletes to be vulnerable with you, but you as an authority figure have to first mirror that, mimic that for the athletes. So again, if if you're reading through Dear Coach or even just anything in in this podcast or anything you've learned and you're like, gosh, I feel so bad. I wish I could go undo that. It's not about necessarily undoing it, but it's about going and saying, hey, I take responsibility for that. And I just want to sincerely apologize. Uh, so besides on my bookshelf, where can people find Dear Coach? Yeah, um, you can find Dear Coach. So it's on Amazon. You can also go online. Books a Million, Barnes and Noble also have it as well. Um, and so right now, I believe it's it's only online. Uh, for any of those that are interested in a signed author copy uh, from me, you can go on my Twitter account, which is at Doc. Uh, underscore Serdner, so D O C underscore S E R D N E R, um, and you can fill out the form there, and I can send you um, a link, like an invoice, and do the signed author copies that way, and I write a nice little note in it. We will have links to all of that in the in the video description of the show notes as well, so people can Wonderful. just go down and click. Um, well, thanks so much for joining us. Is there anything else that you want to say about it before we sign off? Gosh, no, I think if, uh, you know, I feel like we just kind of scratched the surface today on so many things and I could have talked for hours and hours. Um, so for anybody that is interested and in, maybe you just want to talk to me, to, want to talk to me more, you can find me like on my, uh, either Instagram or Twitter handle again at doc Serdner, um, and just reach out if, if you have any questions or want to collaborate a little bit more, I would love to get involved. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Of course. Thanks. Well.